Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this, the seventh webinar in our series to get in shape. This is a series that we've designed to help financial advisors get your businesses ready for the new regime. My name is Mark Milinchevich. I lead the Advisor Transition Working Group at the FSC, and it is my pleasure to welcome back to the series uh, David Greenslade from Strategy, and to welcome to the series Russell Hutchinson of Chatswood Consulting. Both of these people will be known, I'm sure, to everybody on this call because they've been in the industry helping advisors for a long time. So it's, a, it's an absolute pleasure to have such experts in with us today. Before I get them started, I just want to remind you about the sessions that we've had so far in this series. And you can watch any that you've missed or re-watch any that you have seen on the FSC's YouTube channel. So if you go to getinshape.nz, you will find links to the previous videos. Our first one was on licensing and structuring your business for, for a transitional and full license. Our second one was around the obligations for your financial advice provider and financial advisors on day one of the new regime. Our third one was around preparing contracts. So having contracts with, uh, between financial advice providers, authorized bodies, uh, financial, uh, uh, financial advisors, and so forth. The fourth one was to remind you to comply with the Financial Advisors Act until the 15th of March, 2021, because that law continues to be in force. The fifth one was where we welcomed uh, Angus Dale Jones, John Bodica, Derek Grantham, and Sharon Corbett from uh, the FMA, the Ministry, and the Co-Working Group to talk us through what was happening and to update us on all the latest information. And then our sixth webinar, which was the previous one, was an opportunity to redesign your advice process. So in the last webinar, we, we asked you to challenge the way that you give your advice now, uh, review it in terms of the new obligations, the, the code of conduct, that is going to come in force and take the opportunity to, to really reflect on how you give advice and how you will meet the uh, requirements going forward. We're now in, as I say, the seventh in the series. This uh, takes a little step forward now. Now that you've had an opportunity to look at your advice process and challenge it, if you get a really strong, slick process in the, in the way that you do things in your business, both in your advice and the way you run your business generally, it then can be time to evaluate the technology you use your business. Uh, use in your business to make it more effective. And so this webinar is about selecting technology and identifying technology that can help you run your business to be more effective. And uh, remember, of course, as you go through this webinar, as we go through this webinar, you can type questions into q and I'll be monitoring the Q&A for Russell and David, so I'll pass on questions as they come through so that they can focus on what they're talking about. Uh, so please engage. We'd love to hear questions from you so that we can make this as useful as we can for you. And without any further ado, I'll hand it over to David. Thank you, David. Great. Thanks, Mark. And uh, welcome, everyone, to uh, this, this seminar today. So the good news is neither Russell nor I are conflicted around um, being purveyors of technology that would be directly related to what we're talking about here today. But having said that, both of us work with technology providers uh, in all shapes and forms, and we literally see hundreds and hundreds of advisor practices and the way they have and haven't uh, implemented technology. And, and so we have, what we want to try and do today is just uh, sort of create the scene around what is happening as far as changing consumer expectations, because everything we do as a future FAP should be orientated towards what our clients want and need. And, and then we want to be able to talk through how technology is changing so exponentially fast and, and why you don't necessarily want to be at the bleeding edge of um, technology, but you do need to be thinking about technology today, but also where technology is heading over the next few years so that you're not putting in place technology that is already behind this the times when consumer expectations have moved on. Uh, Russell and I will give you a, a quick snapshot of, of what a, a technology integrated office might look like, uh, a, a couple of comments around FAPs, and, and, and if you're trying to select what FAP you plan to join, if you're going to be an authorised body or a financial advisor, then, then here's a couple of tidbits to, to think about, and then, then we'll talk about some processes and some procedures 
that you may want to use for uh, selecting appropriate technology. So Naomi will just bring up the next slide for us at the moment. And, and what we just want to talk about here is where our, our client's mindset has now moved to. Now, this mindset had started to, to change well before COVID and any form of lockdown came. So the things we're talking about, what clients wanted, were quite evident probably 18, 24 months ago. But it's all around speed of delivery. They want stuff that is nice and simple and easy to understand. And it needs to be customized for them. So they don't want the same old uh, stuff rehashed. They don't want e -zines. They don't want stuff that's coming out to them that is uh, generic and is not specific to uh, their particular needs. So everything needs to be formatted, relevant, and made directly applicable to what they need. Also, different clients have different learning styles and comprehension uh, techniques. And so you need to, as part of your data collection, is identify what type of technology or what type of advice process they prefer uh, the, the best. Some people prefer paper, some people prefer pictures and diagrams, some are more auditory orientated, or they need video or whatever. So you, you've got to identify what clients need and then make sure you have the processes and the technology so that you can put all of that in place and deliver fast, simple, effective uh, solutions that they can easily understand and easily implement. Clients these days don't want to be passive in any form of engagement. They want to be actively participating in the decision making. And this is all part of this evolution away from the historical advice process, which was all around consultative, where you are the, the font of all knowledge and the client comes and sees you. And as the oracle, you inform them about what they particularly need. That was a very passive type of uh, uh, client advisor relationship. In today's world, uh, it's more collaborative. And that is where you are the trusted librarian as the financial advisor. They come to you because you have access to more tools and more information than, that would, than what they would necessarily have access to. And then you guide them through a discovery process to, to help them uh, achieve the right outcome. And then you've got to be able to wrap all of this together and go, is this value for money? Remembering that value for money doesn't mean cheap. It means, does the client perceive that whatever time and whatever financial resources they've committed, have they got the value out of it and, and has it met their expectations and their needs? And then, Russell, is there anything you want to add to what they want before you then cover off what they don't want? Yeah, there's, no, I think I'll just talk about some of the things that they're about, you know, sort of what they don't want to encounter in it. And it's, um, I think, you know, David's made some excellent points there. And it is, what we've got is a, a rapidly changing situation with our customers, which is that uh, a few years ago, perhaps it was enough to simply participate in what was then web 2.0 and now and so we tended to have things like a you know business website and some basic connections and you know business card holders type stuff on on common platforms but now what we've got is we've got another generation of customers coming through and we've got people who are being dragged online by the current covid crisis and their experience is a very contemporary one so um you know some of these customers are, are not even really engaged around email at all it's all around messaging services yeah so um they are living on current platforms. So for example, New Zealand has one of the highest usage rates of Facebook in the world. And so an awful lot of our customers uh, are spending an awful lot of their time online seeing it through, um, if you like, the, the prism of an existing platform like Facebook. And so, you know, can we connect and engage with them in that context? Um, if you are not familiar with a mail paradigm, and you're more familiar with a messaging paradigm, you don't think in terms of attachments that you open 
you think in terms of links that you can click to access content, which might take you, for example, to a client portal and so on. So they don't want to be taken out of the, their um, zone of familiarity, which might be different to the one that you're used to. And they also don't want to have to install new software or new applications. They don't want to have lots and lots of bumps or cr sort of crunch over the points and feel those points of resistance as they move into whatever your digital experience is going to be for them. So thanks for that, Russell. So, so the, the key take out on that slide then is that whatever solution you are looking at implementing or have implemented, it needs to be able to talk through to whatever uh, platform your clients are using. So, so look at open architecture as much as you can. Would that be a fair sort of summary there, Russell? I think so. Yeah, that's right. And uh, to engage with the customer where they are is the most important thing. Great. So Naomi, next slide, please. Okay. So when we're looking at technology, it's, it's moving faster than most of us probably comprehend. And just yesterday, there was a, a survey that was published in the States and it, it surveyed um, several hundred ad advisor businesses in, in the US and Canada. And what it identified there is that with the lockdown that is going on over there, 77% of US businesses, this is financial advisory businesses, have had a 20% or larger impact on their bottom line revenue purely as a result of not having the right technology available at the right time to meet Changing, rapidly changing customer expectations around delivery. And, and so what we have to be doing as financial advisors is be thinking about not only today, but where things are moving into the, uh, in, in, in as far as the future is concerned. So whatever solution you have today or have in the future, it, um, what you're going to find is technology is faster, cheaper, and easier to use. So if you looked at solution A three years ago, and it was prohibitive, but it was ideal, then perhaps you may need to go back and readdress solution A today and see how much cheaper it is today and what enhancements it also has. But also think about where that technology is going. You don't want to go for a legacy system that hasn't got plans in place to rapidly evolve onto a new platform or to be more open uh, and, and so on and so forth. If you're looking at technology that is so complex that you need manuals, then you're probably looking at the wrong software solution. Most software these days is pretty intuitive. The other big issue that we have, and I'll get Russell to chime in on this in, in, in two ticks, is, is many of us in our businesses have an in-house server. Now that server may have done us proud for a number of years, uh, and it's fast, efficient, and low cost. But many of those services, servers are coming to the end of their economic life. And, and now what we have with cybersecurity and with holding more client data than ever before, those servers may not be the, the safest way to store our client uh, information. So, so now is the time, if you haven't already considered it, to be thinking about, do I now move all of my client data into the cloud so that I can access it remotely? Or do I have a mixture of cloud and in-house server? And if we're talking cloud-based, then you've got things like SharePoint, Microsoft Office 365, and so on and so forth. What, what are your, your thoughts and views and what you've seen out there, Russell? Well, this is obviously a hugely challenging environment, you know, where we've got more and more data um, residing uh, online and uh, we've got more and more people thinking well I'd like to have a look at that data so there's criminal activity that we have to be aware of you know and so I think at the very highest level um, uh, there's just a couple of observations one is about failure right so uh, drive failure um, is more common now than um, cloud service failure, okay? So if you're gonna lose uh, a record, it's more likely to be because a local drive fails and your backup has somehow failed than a cloud service provider failing. So that's, there's, there's a technology versus, you know, local performance versus, you know, cloud storage performance issue to consider. And then we have, you know, the, the cybersecurity um, uh, realm to, to um, take care of. So if we have our own servers and our servers are permanently plugged in so that staff in remote locations can dial in, then we have um, a vulnerability. 
and we need to address that and there are some good um, services that can do vulnerability testing for you and so forth um, but generally you're going to find that say for instance you know um, AWS or Microsoft Azure they're going to be all across the cybersecurity dimension at a level that we in our own individual businesses cannot obtain so they're going to do that very very well for us and then thirdly we've got a legal and regulatory dimension which is about ensuring that we can always have records available for the regulator when they require those and we must meet that requirement too so we have it's a balance we have to meet all three of those requirements at a high level that's um you know my choice uh you know, personally is is to make use of cloud services but it's a kind of a hybrid you also maintain local copies which are you know it which are in physically secure and uh, they're not accessible you know via online mechanisms so that you don't have to have that same kind of you don't have that same point of vulnerability that's being managed for you by one of those large well-resourced organizations great thanks for that so video meetings and it's really good to see that the advisor industry has embraced this but whatever technology you look um, at, at adopting or have recently adopted, make sure it's easy for you to be able to integrate whatever video methodology, be it Zoom, Teams, Google Hangout, make sure that can integrate into your CRM or into whatever system you're using. So that that way then, if you decide to give advice via say uh, Zoom, like, like we, we're talking about now, you can record that and then, then in many instances, you actually don't need to have a written statement of advice because it doesn't say in the new regime that all advice has to be in writing. So it could be a, a, a video recording or an audio recording. But increasingly what we're seeing in some businesses, they just haven't yet ad adopted any form of video integration. There's one particular business we're dealing with. It's got 16 advisors in the entire business there is only one uh, PC or one computer screen or one laptop that actually has a camera. So if anyone wants to do any form of video, uh, this is out of 16 advisors, they have to go to one uh, device to do that. And, and that's, that's terrible. And that just doesn't even link through into any mechanism to be able to save it. And so, you know, those sorts of businesses need to evolve, particularly the business I'm talking about. It's, it's, it's into very complex type of uh, advice. And, and that's where, with what lends itself beautifully to video. So, Russell, how are you seeing advisors, particularly on the life side, using uh, video? It's been a, an amazing um... Uh, difference between those that were using video before lockdown say and those that uh, and those that weren't and so there are really sort of three groups to think of there are those that were using video extensively before and they've adjusted really really well and so it's really exciting what they've been able to do even with um, purely standard kit right so if um, if if you've got as David was saying uh, camera audio the basic kit, then you can take your business online uh, using purely standard, you know, services, even if they're not integrated right now. So, and then you've got people who, you know, during the last couple of months have made that transition slowly. And, you know, they've tended to find that it's been an easier transition than they would have expected. And this is one of the great things, uh, dare I say it, about what's going on around the world is that that compelling event has forced a lot of customers to work in this way, which now means it's no longer an issue for you to say, let's make a Zoom meeting. You know, it's a great opportunity. And then last of all, there's a few gr groups of people who are still really um, worried about um, taking their business into, you know, using video. And I want to talk about video content too, but into say using, you know, video conferencing and uh, they're still hanging back from that. And unfortunately that's a major limiting factor. And of course, it's not just video conferencing. I was speaking with a, uh, a large mortgage advice business uh, about a month ago, and every single one of their people is kitted up to provide, you know, to do video conferencing with customers. But also most of their people are now so used to that, they're used to explaining what they do online, that they constantly produce a stream of short video segments, which they have on their YouTube channel, they have available on their company website, they leave a long trail of breadcrumbs in the online world, which is this is how we work and customers find them that way. And it's really exciting to be able to reach new customers in that way. No, that's good. And, and 
increasingly in integration with research providers is critical because you've got to have a solid base behind what you're recommending. So if you're doing a video conference uh, call or whatever with a client, if you can bring up on the screen whatever research that, that you have, uh, let's say it's Quote Monster as an example, and be able to work through with the client uh, there and then how, how products uh, compare. That's, that's really critical. And then if you can take that data and then put it into your advice uh, process, uh, that's really cool. So, Russell, anything you want to talk about on the research providers and also the ecosystem approach as far as applications? I do appreciate you mentioning the magic word quote monster there. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, in spite of the statement earlier that we're not conflicted, of course, I do have an interest in quote monster. But, you know, most of this ecosystem of stuff that we're talking about, you know, I don't have any particular axe to grind, which is really, really cool. Um, so, yeah, there's, I guess one of the questions that we're often asked is, uh, especially by an advisor, perhaps in the early stage of making a transition and taking their business digital is, why can't I have just one system that does it all for me, you know, and, and that would be, that would be easier. Can I just buy one thing and just do it all in there? And I suppose the analogy is that's a bit like, well, you kind of can. So, for example, you could basically build and almost fit out your entire home just from what you can buy in Bunnings. Heck, they do kitchens and bathrooms now too, and, and they do garden furniture, so you could do that. But you can kind of imagine if you restricted yourself just to one shop, even if it's a really big one, then you are going to come across some boundaries. It's simpler, um, definitely, but you may find that you sort of rub up against some, some borders which you don't like so much. Um, whereas a, a different approach is that if you, if you uh, look out there in the world and you, you see that there's an awful lot of these different web services that you can use, you can kind of pick from those, those that are the best, uh, perhaps just the best in terms of the best fit for your business um, and assemble your own uh, best of breed, which particularly suits your advice style and how you engage with clients. And, and so you can construct that. And there's no one right answer. I think that you'll find, some of you will find a home perhaps with a platform doing most things and using a few other pieces of software. Others will definitely go to the other end of the spectrum and say, no, I'm going to find, I'm, you're going to use many different systems and kind of weave them together using um, APIs or other kinds of interface. And if you're a smaller business, the warmware interface works okay too. Great. So, so what Russell's also sort of talking about there is, is some of the specific solutions. So if you look at those end-to-end -end solutions, the, the sort of the, 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 the granddaddy of them all, I suppose, is, is X-Plan uh, that's out there. Uh, it, it's, it ticks all the boxes as far as compliance, but the feedback we often get is it's not user-friendly and it feels clunky in, in some advisors' minds. So sadly, they don't use it or use all of its functionality and they just use it as a glorified sort of, uh, uh, sort of Microsoft Office uh, sort of type of suite. And then you've also got the base plates and then you can move to product specific solutions like the trails of this world, which are modern, agile. Um, they, they, they look really good they, and they, they feel good, uh, but they deal primarily either with mortgages or with risk and they don't do all of the comprehensive stuff, but they are evolving. Or you can move to the more open architecture solutions that are primarily CRM, but they have all sorts of other modules that you can add on. And that's the examples of Zoho and Sugar um, and HubSpot and so on and so forth. And then you get the sort of the Rolls-Royce solution, which is significantly more uh, expensive, which is the sales forces of, of this world. And, and so all of them have their place. Uh, it's just a matter of, which solution is going to be most applicable uh, to you. Anything, Russell, you want to say about that before we move to the next slide? Yeah, and I think um, we're going to expand on this a little bit later, but um, uh, whichever solutions that you, you're looking at down there, um, your use of a system is far more likely to determine your success than perhaps the, uh, the, the boundaries that that system imposes upon you. There are some exceptions to that. And I think David's called out some of those, like um, you know, the extent to which a system might be specific to a particular category of advice. You know, that's definitely one to watch. But um, I've 
I've seen advisor businesses work successfully with every single one of the um, solutions listed on that page there. And of course, there are dozens of others. I think if you go to Google and you type in top 50 web CRMs, you'll get 50 businesses there. Um, probably the 50th, the smallest, has you know uh, a market capitalization of uh, you know in the hundreds of millions. So you know there's some very, very there's a very broad range of very robust providers, and uh, so we're going to kind of shift in the next couple of slides to talking more about exactly how you choose and how you use those systems, which is is really going to be your determinant for success. Great. So the next slide. Okay. So. If we're looking at a technology integrated office, then, then and the, the slide after this will, will give you an example of that, then what it needs to do is be absolutely client focused so that what's happening is all the various parts of the technology come together to provide an exponentially better client experience. And a byproduct of that is obviously improved efficiency, lower cost and so on and so forth. The integrated office needs to be both front and back office. And by that, we mean it's got to be great when it's interacting with the client, but the real benefit from a process perspective is how it, it feeds through to product providers, how it feeds through into research, how it feeds through into compliance. So that that way then uh, everything integrates together. It needs to be fast and it needs to be seamless in, in everything it does. And then it also, and increasingly, we're seeing this uh, advent of client portals. So one of the weak points from a digital uh, interface perspective is emails, where the, the fancier you make your statements of advice and, and other forms of advice documents, then the bigger the files become and the harder they are to move backwards and forwards via email. So increasingly, particularly in the States, people have got client portals, which in other words is, is akin to a Dropbox on steroids and so on and so forth. But at the top end, people are customizing them. They're making them really attractive and easy to uh, uh, interface with. They have all the client planning tools sitting in it and all the client documents sit within the client portal. And as the client adds or updates their data in the client portal, or as the advisor does the same thing, it pings uh, 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 notifications out to the advisor and the client. And that way then all of the communication is done in the cloud, nice and secure, and you haven't got this ping pong of emails that are going backwards and forwards. So from a cyber security perspective, uh, it, it's a lot, lot stronger. And then obviously we've talked about the collaborative versus the traditional advice process. So Naomi, can you just sort of bring up this next slide? But you'll see there, it, it may look very busy, but and so, so we won't spend a whole heap of time on this now, but we encourage you to go and look at it after this seminar, once, once these slides are up on the FSC uh, uh, hub. But you'll see there we've got a, a client focus where, where you'll have your digital meeting rooms, video conferencing, you may have a client portal or whatever. You'll have your database in whatever shape or form it happens to be, maybe one of those providers we've just recently talked about. Um, and that will be CRM. Notice we've got some business intelligence sitting in there as well. You could have a whole lot of dashboards that, are, uh, uh, that, are, that, that you build automatically uh, within your CRM. Uh, it will include your document management and commissions and all of that. And then you've got your business support out to one side where you've got your research providers, you've got your training, uh, be it a radar, uh, like an online CPD or whatever the, the, the case happens to be. But that's what we're talking about here is it brings everything together so that the advisor can focus uh, purely on the client and then the business just flows out from that. So Russell, anything briefly you want to talk about uh, in, in that slide? Nice. I, I want to just um, briefly talk about this, this concept of client portals and how that relates in a low engagement or a low involvement type of product, as we know, perhaps life insurance is. So um, if, uh, if I have a portfolio of investments and um, I'm, I'm working with my advisor, research tells us that once the size of that portfolio exceeds um, about what I would spend on a car or on a new kitchen, then I become much more engaged and I'm going to um, be interested in looking at the information around that um, much more frequently. 
and so I've got, I've got a high level of engagement. Over in our world, in terms of life and health insurance, we tend to find that customers are much less engaged. They will interact with us much less frequently than they will on their investment portfolio. And so that presents us some challenges in, ter in terms of achieving the same levels of you know, interaction in digital. Um, as say an investment advisor might get with larger clients. So there's a couple of ways to go with this. And one is to recognize that we're a low involvement category, lean into that, so to speak, in which case you find that clients tend to forget specific um, passwords. They find it different because their frequency of interaction is lower. So they're not as engaged in that kind of, it, and they find it harder to use client portals in the same sense, okay? Um, and so we have to be present on platforms where they are, have different methods to easily authenticate them so that they can access their cover information when they need it, which quite often is when they're ready to make a claim. So then they're stressed and they're worried about it and they're looking for information and it's a bit difficult for them. But there are ways to do that. And um, partly that's about being present wherever they are. So that's being present in their LinkedIn, in their Facebook, in their phone, in their, you know, and having some good systems like that, having a Wii app in their phone, where, which connects directly to us and things, you know, which help us to identify them. On the other side of the coin, you've got some insurers who are leaning heavily in a different direction, and they're trying to boost the engagement with the client so that the client is going to seek out that and, and engage with that client portal more, you know, much more than they would otherwise. And, and this is usually through tools like, um, you know, uh, uh, health related applications. So I can, I can track, I can link my wearable devices to it and I'm going to get a lot more engagement that way. And if there are ways for you to connect with that trend, then that's going to be really powerful for you in terms of building that engagement. A Little bit more complicated from a systems perspective, but really worth it perhaps in the long run. Great, thanks very much. So Naomi, next slide please. Okay, so, so just briefly on advice documents, remembering that advice documents don't have to be in writing. They could be video, they could be audio. Uh, that, if you go to the extreme, it could be whatever you've put up on, the, on a series of whiteboards, uh, you, could, you could video that with a phone and then send that to the client, but it, it just needs to meet the, the basic premises that are, are contained within the Code of Professional Conduct for Financial Advice Services, which is the new code that comes in on the 15th of March next year. So, but increasingly we're seeing digital delivery. Everything is around nice, simple, clear, concise, and effective. That aids understanding. You've got to make sure that you've taken reasonable steps as a financial advisor to ensure that the client understands that. So by that means just you just don't tell them once via one medium that this is what we're recommending, you will do it progressively and you'll do it vo uh, via multiple of ways. It may be talking to them in a face-to-face -face meeting. It may be giving them some form of advice documentation. It may be a, uh, following it up with a, a, a confirmatory phone call afterwards. But you document all of those things to ensure that you've taken reasonable steps. Also, the days of providing advice documents that are 20, 30, 40 pages long, they're, they're long gone. Um, the smaller you make it, the better it is, but make sure you've got that additional supporting information available somewhere so that if the client wants to see it, then they can click the link and it's there immediately that they, they need it. But don't make the actual base advice document too large because clients just don't read it. So clients often are more visual. Um, so, so the more color, the more diagrams you can put into this sort of stuff, the better. Uh, we're increasingly building in thumbnails so that what we can now do is that the, the client may see a document as part of the initial advice um, meeting. And then that same document is embedded in as a, as a tiny little thumbnail into the statement of advice. If the, the client wants to read it as uh, right there and then during uh, as they're clicking through the advice document, they can click it and it can expand out. They can read it. They can click it again and it can tracks back through. And if they don't want to read it then, then they, they'll at least see it in the appendices at the end. So all of this stuff is available, it's just that the client doesn't have to be overwhelmed with seeing it all at once. 
and we've obviously talked about uh, client portals. Anything briefly, Russell, you want to add to that? Yeah, I think that that's really cool. I'd, I'd zero in on the point about linked documents. Any concept that you as an advisor find yourself explaining more than once probably should be explained somewhere in a standard form in writing and in video perhaps, possibly in audio as well, um, and so that you can reuse it again and again. Yeah, and that's going to be really helpful in terms of uh, achieving both a concise, but also having a reference library of more extensive information for customers that need to look at that. There's a couple of comments in the chat, a really good one just around video conferencing. And, um, you know, so to give, to achieve what David's just talked about, if you were working through an advice conversation with a client, for example, in Zoom, the client's present, you're present, and there's some shared content that you're working on and that is recorded, then you have a fabulous record of the advice already made. Great, awesome. Next slide, please, Naomi. Okay, so just a very brief word about FAPS. So uh, if you are sort of highly technology focused and you're trying to move to the leading edge, then have a chat to whoever you're looking at joining as far as a FAP is concerned to make sure that they are on the same page as you are. Because the last thing you want to do is join a, a financial advice provider where you're at one end of the technology spectrum and they're at the other. And because what's going to happen is you're going to be immediately frustrated. And that can lead to discontent with your FAP, and then you may want to part ways down the track. So make sure that your thinking is congruent with the FAP that you're planning to, to join. Also, as a compliance provider, we look at it and go, uh, compliance will always be cheaper if we're coming in and doing an annual compliance review, if we can get um, a, a, an access uh, permission to look at a client's file. Because as, as Russell and I have both alluded to, no longer does advice in the new regime have to be all encapsulated via one document. It can be a series of videos, audios, screenshots, uh, or whatever, or it could be a statement of advice. So often, we need to be able to see the holistic client file. So being able to dive straight in to, to client A and looking at the entire audit trail around the interactions can help us form a view as the compliance provider about whether uh, all of the, um, the, the compliance obligations are being met. By having the electronic access, it means that the compliance costs come down because we don't have to be on site and it means we're, we're not asking the advisor to send us uh, documentation so the compliance review doesn't become a burden. We're just quietly in there looking at all the information that we need. Also, technology is so powerful and so pervasive that in many instances, it can control the way that you deliver your business. So if you join a FAP and you're using that FAPS technology and all of your client information is stored within that FAP, then if you decide that you want to leave, it becomes that much more difficult to uh, dislocate yourself from that FAP. And that's why it's so important that you make sure you make the right decision on day one about which FAP you're going to, to join. Because technology is a business enhancer, but it can lock you in uh, from that sort of perspective. Anything briefly, Russell, you want to say on that? Well, look, the essence of um, anybody being able to use your data to assist in compliance is going to be the quality of the data. So whether that's a different FAP or a compliance officer consulting and looking at your business, um, or if it's you as a manager employing other financial advisors, the big challenge is data quality. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that on, um, on the next page. So I'll leave that. Right, so Naomi, please. So this is your baby here, Russell. You go for it. Oh, cool. So we've got a couple of things going on here. And, and um, I suppose sometimes we start from the point of view of over here in the production paradigm that we say, well, like I, I'm going to look for a system that's going to enable me to do something for me, maybe save me time producing SOAs or maybe save me time in my uh, uh, annual review process with clients. And that's great. 
um, that's a reasonable basis for choosing a system. Um, and sometimes we start from this position here of a technology paradigm where we say, I kind of just know there's something to this internet thing. It's been going on a little while now. I think I'd better go and choose a technology system to help me make, take advantage of this trend. So we're kind of really thinking about the technology. And then perhaps if you've spent more than about 10 minutes on LinkedIn, a LinkedIn influencer has tried to talk to you and say, what you need to do is produce excellent content. And that's this third column here where we're talking about having content paradigm where we're thinking about what can I say and put out there that's gonna make people become interested in what I do. And so that's kind of one way of thinking about what you're doing. And um, then lastly, um, perhaps, Unfortunately, the least commonly used is the customer paradigm, which is where we need to sit with the customer and say, hey, wh wh who are the people and where are the people that need me and, and, and what do they really want and what's their starting point? And again, none of these particular ways of thinking is necessarily wrong, but I really want to highlight that last one and say that the more we think in terms of where the customer is, the more likely we are to design systems which are going to connect well with them, work well for them, and therefore enhance our business. And I, I tend to think that if we, if we start with that firmly in view and then kind of work our way back through the others, we're gonna come up with a much more customer focused answer. And lockdown highlights that for us, you know, so um, if sometimes you can, you can end up with a real Rolls Royce piece of technology, but if you're only seeing four, five, six customers a week, which is very common for modest size financial advice businesses, an awful lot of that you don't need. If you start over here with the customer and you start having more conversations with people, more interesting discussions that lead to advice, then uh, you, you, you're going to fill that pipe and you're going to build better systems that come out of the back of it. Um, right. So that will do on that slide. <laughs> right. Thanks. So Naomi, next slide, please. Okay. So, so the guidance note that we've got on the right hand side of the screen, that's really the how to. So that will help step you through the decision making process around uh, what it is that you, or what the problem is that you're trying to identify uh, and then what are the steps I need to go through to select something? So in broad sort of terms, we're saying you need to define your needs. And, and here we're talking often about your needs versus your wants. And, and, and think about what drives value in your business from a, from a client perspective and also from an efficiency uh, perspective as well. Uh, then, then you've got to be able to identify a shortlist. In other words, you've done your due diligence around what you need. You've done all of your sort of Googling around what's available out there. There's always going to be a multitude and you want to bring that down into a shortlist and, and the guidance note helps you sort of uh, develop that. But then don't race into buying something on day one. Uh, ask for a test drive. Uh, get hold of the system and then use it for a while. And, and what we try and do is, is talk about the sand pit and that you want to be able to run a couple of systems as well as your existing one and you just have a play with it. You put a little bit of data in it and you might try running uh, a couple of clients through it just to work out what you think is going to be best for your business because you don't know what you don't know until you've actually uh, been using it. And then... You need to have a methodology around how you choose your winner. And that, and that needs to be based more on logic rather than on emotion. So the guidance note will, will show you a matrix that you can use. And then whatever you do, don't try and build Rome in, in a day. When you roll it out, it needs to be rolled out progressively. And, and in many cases, the software solution you buy will, may be enormous. It could be this wide. But on day one, start with it nice and small. And, and get the basics right first. And then as you've got the basics right and everyone in the business is on the same page, progressively build it out. But take time. Uh, whereas too often, both Russell and I see people, they just race in and they try and put the whole nine yards into their business on day one. And then they end up only using 20 or 30% of it. And that's what we're talking about improving over time. Russell, your thoughts on that? Really, really um, important to do this. And in terms of defining your needs, there's always the 
the temptation to go broad, as David's just been talking about, and there's a big cost to doing that. And so paying real attention to what drives value in your business, and, and if you sit down and have a think about that, that's most likely to be, um, how can I start new conversations with people? Um, how can I make existing conversations with my customers more valuable to them, easier for them to access, easier for them to say yes to, you know, easier for them to um, uh, re repeat and revisit so that they become more familiar with what we're saying. Um, and then lastly, probably, how do I um, uh, save time and money and improve accuracy and consistency in my business and these types of things. So these are, these are, are having a really strong focus on that. And then quite often, once you look at what you're doing really critically, um, don't get led astray by uh, all of the bells and whistles that might be offered by lots of providers, but um, examine your use of current systems. You probably find that um, quite often uh, it, you can go a long way improving what you do with what you have. Um, and sometimes running a good project around that, a consistent project for a period of time, can uh, take you a long way forward to understanding your needs so that you know what you're going to get next um, before you leave that. You know. Great, thanks. And, and the next slide then, please, Naomi. Okay, so just a few basic principles about um, uh, what we need to be looking at. So, Russell, you want to talk about some of these? I really want to talk about data strategy, and this is so important. We've looked quite a lot at advisor records, and um, there's three layers to this. So, briefly, there's what you see in your, say, your CRM. And then there's maybe a scanned document that you might be able to access behind that. And then there's possibly a, a, uh, a, a paper document that was scanned and that now lives in a box somewhere, right? Now, um, ideally, to achieve some of the gains that David's been talking about in terms of compliance, you need to have confidence in what's in the CRM. But very often, you don't. And a good example would be, say, um, where there's an income field. Now, of course, income changes all the time, but income is a, a, a really important piece of data in, in an awful lot of financial advice that we give, right? But some client records, there will be an income amount in the field there, which is very out of date. And sometimes there won't be an income field in there. Is that because they earn nothing or because it wasn't filled in? Right. And so what you need is confidence in your data. Uh, now, if you sit there and you look at that and you think, I'm not going to be able to make sure that that data is accurate and right all the time. Better not to capture it at that level. Better to force the reader to go through to the next level, which might be what was income at the time of the application or the consultation of the advice process. On the other hand, if you want to be able to use that data effectively, you need to have confidence in null answers. So if there is a zero there, you know it's a zero. If there is a number there, you know it's a reasonable number. If it's date and time sensitive, then you know it was correct at a certain date and you don't assume that it continues to be correct. You know, so that's, um, that's a, just a little bit around data strategy. It gets a bit complicated, and so uh, what we tend to find is that it's better if you can keep an, a smaller set of data and you know it's correct than attempting to keep a really big set of data and you end up with loads of holes in it, and it turns out you can't really use any of it because you can't rely on it. Great. So some of the things that we've seen that are really cool out there, we, we've seen advisors sort of engaging directly with clients via the, the website, and then they take their clients on a guided discovery, almost like robo advice, and it, and it moves their way through. Uh, and so, so the, the, the client starts the journey by themselves, and then they just click on a button, and then the, the, the advisor will chime in and then the advisor takes over and they've sort of seamlessly moved from the the website through into a secure portal at that sort of point and and then as a result of that they then uh, produce the statement of advice almost instantaneously at the end of that that sort of consultation so the client starts off on a journey but by that they actually end up with, with some specific advice we're seeing some really cool things happening with the likes of uh, Zoho and some of those other uh, open architecture CRM where advisors are building integrated advice processes uh, and they've got some cool dashboards so that they can track exactly where things are at. Uh, that we're seeing some cool client um, uh, engagement and client satisfaction so that the advisor and the client have an interaction and then immediately the client um, uh, uh, rates the advisor and how 
uh, well the advisor met their, their expectations and how well the client actually understood that. And that provides immediate feedback. And that's all part of good conduct uh, that is so vital that we all, as future FAPs, need to be able to prove to the FMA that we're meeting. Any other cool things that you're seeing out there, Russell? I just, um, one advisor that uh, only really started um, delivering advice online because of recent lockdown, um, they just started uh, delivering all their um, all their advice meetings on, on uh, Zoom. They record every single one because storage is so cheap now. Um, their view was, why not? Um, and uh, so the, the feedback from that has been incredible. Uh, you mentioned uh, using client rating systems. So, that, you know, so there's, uh, for instance, a, a system called Ask Nicely, which is a method of um, sending a client one question, straightforward net promoter score question, you know, how likely are you to recommend my service? The immediate feedback from that is incredible. So they just have that set up so that after every client meeting, they send one of those out, which is absolutely brilliant. Um, I think I mentioned before, you know, another uh, a group, you know, basically recording anything that they've talked about that week, you know, they've, they've discovered that they say more than once or twice. It's, they do a, a short, very short video on it. Um, this, this is such a valuable kind of um, bit of territory for us to talk about. Um, I'm sure we could spend hours on it, though there are so many examples. So um, uh, just looking at the questions, there's, you know, there's another one about you know, online client verification. Um, you know, so there's some interesting territory there. We'd love to get to it, but I don't think we'll cover it in this session now. But, hmm. Okay, so, so Naomi, the, the, the summary. Next slide. Yep, so, so what we're talking about here, just wrapping it all together, is, is technology is a, is a business enhancer. Uh, if, you, if you select the right technology and you use it in the right way and, you've, and it's customer focused, and the whole team buys into it, then you can exponentially increase the value of your business and the amount of business that, that you bring in. Think about technology not in a static way, and that whatever is there today is going to be radically different in the next couple of years. So whatever solution you're looking at, make sure it's got the capability to easily expand out um, and, and, and improve as the technology base improves with it. And make sure that the training of you and your staff is sufficiently robust so that you are all agile and open to the adoption of new technology um, as it constantly improves. Uh, technology can be expensive, so there needs to be a structured process that you need to follow when you go about selecting what it is you need and, and what solution you're going to use and how you're going to uh, implement it into your business. But whatever you do, technology takes time to, to embed and to get it working properly. So the 15th of March is, is get-go day. It may seem a long way away, but when you're looking at it from a technology adoption and implementation perspective, it's incredibly fast. So anything else as far as key takeouts from your perspective there, Russell? Well, I'd just like to encourage people, I'd say, you know, jump in, the water's warm, so to speak. Um, it's uh, there's, This is the best time to be starting. So if you think, well, I haven't started yet, great. You have a great opportunity to start. Have an open mind. Uh, you don't need to necessarily be finding um, industry-specific solutions. A lot of fantastic solutions are available um, uh, you know, good web-based solutions are available for you to weave together a system uh, which is going to work in exactly the way that you do. Um, we haven't uh, spent too much time talking about um, compliance, but uh, uh, the record keeping requirement is absolutely central um, to that. And, uh, you know, taking your business into digital is going to be a great way for you to achieve that and move forward with confidence. Great. So just sort of wrapping up, what, what's our next steps? Where do we need to go to from here as far as our homework um, is, is concerned? Well, the guidance note is up on the FSC website. So um, you can click the link um, that is here that will be on, on, on the site. Uh, so that will take you through some, some logical decision-making processes. Uh, talk to those who have the innovative solutions. They're all good, and it's, it's just a matter of making sure you just don't get mesmerized by, by uh, one versus the other. Go back to the base reasons why you're selecting this stuff. And then obviously, uh, tread carefully, because 
you're spending money. Uh, it's going to change the way you operate. So make sure you make the right decisions for the right reasons. Uh, because a lot of the people you're talking to or you may get advice from have a whole heap of vested interests. So uh, just be careful from that sort of perspective. And so um, thanks very much. And we'll pass back to Mark to wrap it all up. Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. I think there's some really valuable content in there. Uh, we didn't get into, of course, the, the various type of software that are out there and the ins and outs of those software because there's only so much you can do in 45 minutes. And, and there's a wealth of opportunities out there for what's available. And it can seem quite daunting. And, and I'd suggest that one of the, the best things that you can do to get an idea of what's out there and what can be done is to talk to other financial advisors. Because financial advisors are, are already, as some of the examples you've seen today, are, are out there doing great things. And you'll be doing things that some of your colleagues don't know about and your colleagues will be doing things that you don't know about. And sharing those ideas can be a really, really good source of what's available and out there. The, uh, the document that David mentioned there from Strategi is, is thanks to Strategi, kindly up on the FSC website uh, and get in shape.nz so you can find that. And I highly recommend looking through that because it'll, for example, in your due diligence, it's got a lovely checklist of the sorts of things you want to do when you're evaluating a piece of software. Uh, so really, really strong, valuable document and highly recommend you get into that. Thank you very much for attending this webinar. A huge thank you to Russell and David for their involvement in this webinar, and you'll see them in future webinars as well. Uh, the next webinar is going to be in two weeks' time on the 4th of September. We've got a number of exciting topics lined up, and there'll be an invitation that comes out soon. The sorts of topics we've got lined up, we'll have uh, a session on disclosure and disclosure statements in the, in the new regime. We'll have something about uh, your business policies and things once we know a little bit about what the licensing requirements are. We'll talk a bit about financial planning and management of finances in your business, compliance framework and the compliance assurance program, the compliance officer and their role, uh, risk management, governance, director's duties. So there's a whole lot of fantastic topics we've got lined up over the next few webinars to really help you get to grips with this new regime. Once more, a huge, uh, a huge thank you to our, our presenters, to Russell and David, and thank you very much for attending. Please spread the word. Look at the historical webinars that we've got available on this. Uh, we're also in the process of getting uh, CPD uh, credits for these seminars. Again, thank you to, to Strategy and to David for their involvement in that. So uh, those of you who are AFAs that have current CPD requirements, these can help you to achieve those as well. Uh, and you know, continue to challenge your business the way that you do things and look for those, those opportunities to get bigger and better over the next few years and, and look at this regulation change as an opportunity to do great things in your business. Thank you all very much. I look forward to seeing you in two weeks. Bye.